I th- I've thought a lot about family today. I always do over the holidays. I think about my parents who live overseas. I think about my siblings, uh, two of which are uh, live in Texas. One lives here, and I got to have Thanksgiving with him. But family is always on my mind during the holidays. And I was thinking about my mom this week, and there was one particular memory that came up for me. I remember when I was young, and she was sitting at a table, and I remember that the table was white. Okay, so I don't, like, strange details that you remember in memories, right? The table was white, and she happened to have her hand laying on the table, and as a kid, I sat next to her, and I put my hand right next to her hand, and I remember looking at our hands and thinking, oh my goodness, they're identical. (laughs) Like, I have my mother's hands, like same proportions, um, same nails, like the identical hands that she has. They were slightly different sizes at that time. But isn't it funny, the traits that we get from our family? Um, also, I was thinking about like different expressions and different jokes that you really can only make sense in the context of your family of origin. It's like... There's a whole different way of communicating when you're with your family. We're in so many ways similar to our family, and also in many ways we are different. But those similarities and those differences often stand out in the holidays for me. Today we're going to talk about the image of God as described in Scripture. And so we're going to start today in Genesis. And in Genesis, the first couple chapters of the Bible, there's this beautiful, very poetic description of creation. And its purpose is to depict God as the creator, that God is the one who created everything, created day and night, sky and land, the sun, the moon, the stars. God created plants and animals. And last, God created humanity. And it is in these very first, the very first chapter of Genesis that we first hear this phrase, the image of God. I want to go there and read, read that section. So Genesis chapter one, starting verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God create, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the sky, fill the earth, <laughs> it'll be kind of hard to fill the sky, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Such beautiful language. And in translation, the, po- the poetry of it gets lost a little bit. Um, but we see here that God creates everything. And then God creates humanity. And two things are quite unique about humanity. First off, that they were created to rule over the other creatures and rule the earth. That's unique to people. And secondly, that humanity was created in the image of God. Created in the image of God. So I want to talk a little bit about what, what, what does that mean? I find it interesting as we look at this passage, um, just a side note, but that, that God uses both plural and singular, or that both plural and singular pronouns are used to describe God. The triune God, Trinitarian God, the mystery of, of three in one. It's very significant in this passage and very clear that um, 
all humanity was created in God's image. And it specifies both male and female created in the image of God. In the Hebrew, if we were to look at it, um, we would see some of the structure of it, the poetic structure of it, and it's a, a chiasm, meaning it's a re- there's a repetitive literary structure in here that's used to emphasize certain parts. And so it has like a repeated pattern. It's like an A, B, C, C, B, A. And, and in this repeated pattern, the center part, the, the C, C part that is repeated is what's being emphasized. And when you look at this passage, what's being emphasized is that humanity was created in the image of God. So what does this mean? Created in the image of God. Um, if we think back, some, some textual information, um, some, in, in the ancient world, this expression was used, image of God, to typically describe two different things. First of all, it was used to describe idols, which is interesting. Idols that represent uh, gods. It was also used to describe kings or rulers, and so um, we see this word in, in Scripture used in different ways. And, and the rulers and the idols in ancient times were believed to re- be representatives of God. And they were believed to have uh, the authority to rule because they represented the gods. And so with this like context in mind, we look at this passage and we ask, what does it mean that humanity is created in the image of God? Well, first off, it means that humanity, that people are to be representatives of Yahweh, of God. They're also created to rule. And we'll talk about what does that actually mean? mean, created to rule. And it's interesting how in this text you see that before and after created in the image of God, there's conversation about ruling over the animals and ruling the earth. So if humanity is created in the image of God, people are created to reflect God, to reflect the character of God, to live in such a way that demonstrates who God is, to live in such a way that is aligned with the nature and the character of God. So then the other word that's a bit confusing is this word rule or subdue. Some of our, some of our, 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 our translations say that we are to rule the earth, subdue the earth. Really the idea here is to take care of. We, the humanity is to be the, the caretakers of the earth. So God creates all things, creates humanity, places Adam and Eve in this beautiful garden and says, take care of the earth. Take care of the animals. Take care of my creation. Be the, my royal representatives here on earth. It's super significant in here that all humanity is created in the image of God. So, um, in, in ancient, in the ancient world, this would have been quite shocking. And I think if we're to be real honest with ourselves in today, this is also a quite shocking concept to many that it's not just an elite few who are chosen to represent God or or a specific family line that has special status in the eyes of God. But rather, God creates all humanity and um, equally and gives them this task equally. So to summarize, the, this idea of being created in the image of God, we are created to live as God's representatives in this world, caring for the earth and caring for each other. The very next chapter, chapter 3 of Genesis, we read about the fall. 
that humanity fails to surrender to God, fails to live in such a way that aligns with God. Instead of trusting God, Adam and Eve rebel against God and choose to eat from the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And sin and death and pain enter into the human experience, and, and the consequences are drastic and dire for for them and for humanity, for people that follow. As you keep reading the scriptures, as you keep reading the story of God, we read God's covenant with his people Israel. And the whole purpose of making this covenant was with Israel was to bless the whole world. Israel agreed to this covenant, and yet, like all of humanity, continued to miss the mark, continued to fail to live as God's representatives, over and over, unable to fulfill their part of the covenant. And so the whole story of the Old Testament and the new too, but the whole story that we read of Israel is God continually pursuing Israel, inviting them back into relationship with him, back into living a life that reflects the character of God by caring for each other and caring for the earth. And so this God of endless love promises to rescue humanity from, from the brokenness that has been caused by sin. And so moving forward more into the story, enter Jesus. And we call Jesus by many names. He has many beautiful names. Son of God, Lamb of God, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, Messiah, Savior. There's one that we don't often use, but is, is, is used in Scripture of Jesus. And that is that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So at the beginning of scripture, God creates humanity in his own image. And then things go wrong. Humanity fails to reflect the image of God. And so God sends his son, Jesus. And Jesus is described as the image of the invisible God. God made visible in Jesus. And Jesus is, in fact, the creator God. Remember the three in one. Jesus is creator God, fully human and fully divine, and a perfect reflection of an image bearer of God, a perfect reflection of who God is and God's character. And so Jesus came and he taught about the kingdom of God. He taught about the kingdom of heaven. And he said, this is what ruling looks like. This is what being an image bearer looks like. And he taught about an upside down kingdom, or some call it the right side up kingdom, the way things are supposed to be when we love our neighbors, when we love our enemies, we lead by serving others. And Jesus did this. He took on the posture of a servant and he washed his disciples' feet and he healed and he helped others. Jesus taught about humility. The last shall become first. He was radically inclusive. 
eating and hanging out with all sorts of people, welcoming them. He taught and modeled generosity and forgiveness and selflessness. Jesus modeled what it looked like to be an image bearer living out, um, living out as God desires. What it, he modeled how an image bearer of God is to live and what kind of lifestyle reflects the character of God. And in his death and in his resurrection, Jesus made a pathway for humanity to get back to really living as true image bearers of God. I love verse verse 20 of, of the Colossians passage. We read that through him, um, through Jesus, he reconciled to himself all things by making peace through his blood shed on the cross, that Jesus reconciled all people to God making peace through his blood. Many of us today are are followers of Jesus. And and if if you've committed to that journey, it's just that it's a journey of following Jesus. And it's a journey of transformation. It's a journey of being transformed into the image of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, let's let's read verses 17 and 18 together. Um, Paul writes, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I love this thread of the image of God throughout scripture. You have created in the image of God. Um, you have Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And then here through the spirit, we are being transformed into Jesus's image with ever increasing glory. We are created as image bearers of God. And yet having failed to reflect his image to the world, Jesus has come and demonstrated what it looks like, and now through the Spirit, we are being transformed into the image of Jesus. Getting back to our true self, back to who we were created to be a unique and beautiful reflection of God in this world. One of my favorite um, definitions of spiritual formations. I've shared it numerous times because I keep coming back to this, but it's Robert Mulholland's definition of spiritual formation. And he, he defines it as this. He says, it's a process of being conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of others. The process of being conformed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. You know, we live in this in-between world where we know we've, we've been saved. We know the final victory that God's going to make all things new and there will be no more, no more death, no more pain, no more sin or suffering in this world. That the heaven on earth is coming, but we live in this in between world and we're, we're in process. Until then, We ask that the Spirit would transform us, that the Spirit would continue to shape us into the image of God, into the image of Christ, that we would live with more love and joy and peace, patience, kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I like this concept. I like thinking about the image of God and being an image bearer that you and I and everyone else on earth is this image bearer of God. It's part of what it means to be human. If if you're human, then you bear the image of God that we are each created with the capacity to reflect God in a unique way that we're each created with the capacity to rule, quote unquote, as Jesus did, which means 
to care for each other, to lay down our privileges and our power and our rights, and instead to love and to serve and to live in relationship. It's this life of radical love and inclusion. We're created with a capacity to love and a capacity for relationship and a capacity for service. And so today I just wanted to, to invite us all, myself included, to live intentionally as an image bearer of God. To live intentionally in a way that reflects who God is, that reflects the love of God to our families, that reflects the love of God to our friends, that reflects the love of God to those who we don't want to be around, (laughs) to those who maybe we even consider enemies, to reflect the love of God to whoever we're in contact with. I also want to invite us to recognize all humanity as fellow image bearers, to recognize the image of God in others. To be human means that we have this innate, God-given, God-created dignity and worth, that we are equally loved by God, that we are equally treasured and called by God. And I think that if we truly believed this, it would drastically change how we treat people. It would drastically change how we engage in relationships. And it would really help us along the journey of loving our neighbor and loving our enemy. One way that I've heard people describe this is to to see the image of God in the face of someone else. And in Latin, the imago dei, you may you may have heard that expression. That's the image of God in Latin. I ran across some beautiful artwork online um, this week by a Detroit artist. Um, his name is Ndubisi Okoye. Hopefully, I said that correctly. Um, and I thought it was just beautiful. He is an artist. He's works for lots of big companies like Netflix and Pepsi and like car dealerships doing commercials and things like that. But he's passionate about creating art, um, vibrant art with encouraging messages all around Detroit. And he has this collection that he calls Imago Dei art, so the image of God art. And uh, here's just a few samples from his, from his websites. And I just wanted to read a blurb about what he says inspired this art. He writes, This is my attempt to create illustrations that are visually pleasing and biblically sound. My thesis comes from the biblical idea that people are and were made in the image of God. What it means is that God made us to represent him on this earth. That why, that's why we are made to rule over or look after his creation. It also means that we are meant to value the things God values, love, beauty, goodness, justice, etc., It means that we are given characteristics like the ability to love and to be creative, to protect and to make wise decisions. This means that you do not have greater or less, you do not have greater or lesser value based on race, gender, class, intellectual abilities, or other things. All are made equally. And one of the things I love about this art is the, the blue faces are actually, um, pictures of real people. And so online people will send in a picture of themselves and, and he will digitalize that and he will use actual people's faces and then create the art around those faces. I think it's powerful. This, this image, this art, this illustration is powerful. If we could only see God's artwork in each other, the way this artist is portraying it. If we could only see the image of God in each other, 
more and more, then I believe we would treat each other with more kindness and more love and more peace. That is our invitation today, and that is my prayer for my life and and my prayer for all our lives, that we would intentionally live as image bearers, that we would intentionally recognize the image of God in every face that we see and engage and interact with people with that in mind, that we are reflecting the character of God, or we should be reflecting the character of God, and we are speaking to and engaging with an image bearer of God. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you so much. Thank you so much for this, this phrase, the image of God, the, to be image bearers. I thank you for the ways in which you have created us with, in some ways, very similar purposes, and yet also you've created us beautifully unique and diverse, and that we each reflect a piece of you. Lord, I pray that in our families and in our homes, I pray that in our friend networks and in our workplaces, that we would engage in ways that are aligned with you. How we would walk with you in step with the spirit and that what would, that what people would experience from us as image bearers, what people would experience from us as Jesus followers is love and peace. May we be known <laughs> for your love, God. I pray for those of us um, here that that maybe haven't accepted your love for themselves yet. Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts to receive your love. And I pray that you would teach us through your Holy Spirit how to live that out and engage in relationships the ways you would want us to. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.